As U.S. hospitals begin to buckle under the weight of the new coronavirus, doctors and nurses issued a grim plea for more supplies to treat patients and to protect themselves. This is a big, big issue for the whole system. Health care payments are keeping many local residents from getting the treatment they need. 37% of Americans go without recommended care. Your statement says, please pay $220,850. The amount she owed, more than $40,000. I'm not a human to them. I'm a dollar sign. The average cost of treatment for patients rose to $63,000. $17,000 for a lab test, $50,000 for a stay in the NICU. From $18 a tablet jumping to $750 a tablet. About 34 million Americans know someone who died because they couldn't pay for medical treatment. You have surgery and you get a medical bill six months later saying you owe thousands of dollars. We have to do something about the price of health care. It's a right in our country and we should have a right to health care. Our health care is in a crisis. This bubble is going to burst. Healthcare. Is it a right or a privilege? Do we want a system based on profit or rather prevention? Will we place our future in the hands of bureaucrats or that of the people? These are the questions to ponder. healthcare system is broken. Rising costs and growing inefficiencies are putting a heavy burden on the economy. It seems like everyone has a story to tell. going to the doctor, he said, but didn't see me and rear-ended my truck. And then I blew out my other shoulder and tore the labrum out of it. And my left elbow, they had to reconstruct the nerves in it. And that particular brace they gave me uh, after my thumb surgery when I woke up paralyzed um, because the nerves in uh, my leg aren't working right and the muscles, and I got a club foot now. Did you get any sort of um, therapy inpatient anywhere, or? Well, there was a problem um, at the hospital. I was there a week, and uh, they wanted me to go to uh, an inpatient rehab. And so we were waiting there to, to get the okay to go. The lady came out and said I was a good candidate and that they would take me. And we were waiting and waiting to go for a couple of days at the hospital. and. Um, we never got a, a call or anything, and we kept asking the doctor when we're going. And he said, I don't know. So finally, we waited another day and came home and found out that the insurance company didn't send all the approvals to the rehab center, and they wouldn't take me until they got them. And so I've never gotten to go to the inpatient rehab yet. And that, that happened actually uh, three times. The uh, hematologist recommended for them to massage out the edema in my leg three times a day. But when the insurance company was told, they said they don't have enough funds for that to be done. The, the one thing we have a problem with is when the, the doctor orders something that because it, the insurance has to pay for it and they don't always know I guess, or they have vendors that uh, set those appointments up or therapy places, and it's a different person that calls every time that don't even know what's going on. And uh, it takes four or five vendors just to get one appointment. And 
sometimes it's weeks and months even before they get all that worked out while you're just sitting there waiting um, for therapy and things like that. What really doesn't make sense to me is I needed an MRI and so I called around and asked what it cost for with my insurance and they gave me a price of $1,200 to, to about $800 with my insurance. Then I called around to some, I said, what if I just pay you cash, I don't want a receipt or anything for it, and it was 295 out the door. And I didn't go towards my deductible, but I don't understand why I could pay 295 instead of $800 gets billed to my insurance. That doesn't make sense to me. We got married in 1985 at the First yeah. Presbyterian Church. <laughs> so we've been married 34 years this year. Well, after he came home from the hospital, they sent him to different doctors trying to, you know, figure out what all had gone wrong during his surgery. And they were looking at parts and pieces of him. And finally, we got a referral approved for the psychologist. And we went there for a full day evaluation. We uh, got a phone call from the therapist saying that the 13th meeting was to be the last session because they had received an email from the insurance company saying that they were cutting off the sessions, they weren't gonna authorize any more, and it had to end. So that next day we went to his last session and he was very upset the last day we met. They said they wanted me to keep coming, but the insurance wouldn't authorize anymore. And he looked at the therapist and said, oh, you're leaving. And she said, I'm not leaving, I'm, I'll, I'll still be here, but you've done really well. And he started crying and was very upset because she's impacted him so positively. It seems like all they do is one doctor refers you to another doctor. They're doctors, but they only want to treat one thing. And you may have other things wrong with you, but they won't even look at you. And all you can do is wait to go see another doctor to treat whatever other problems you have. So you end up seeing multiple doctors who don't talk, who to, don't each talk other. to each other. And they, all they want to look at is your big toe, if that's what kind of doctor they are. <laughs> it's aggravating this, you can't even see the other doctor until that doctor refers you to that doctor. So that's two months later sometimes just to get some kind of treatment. My name is Angelica. Um, I'm 24 years old, and my first story about healthcare is that when I was around elementary school, I was diagnosed with um, type 2 diabetes. Since then, when I found out, I was heartbroken. I was little, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was good or bad. I've seen people pass away. And it's so hard because my parents tell me, you know, take care of yourself. Because that could happen to you. You can lose a leg. You can lose a finger. You can lose anything. For me, my surprise came at 45. I noticed something. I ignored it. Then I went to see my doctor. Because I'm sure it's nothing, but let's just get it out of the way. Well, she couldn't find anything, referred me to somebody else. She couldn't find anything. We need to do a colonoscopy. Bingo. There it was. Had to then see a surgeon to figure out what it was. Probably wasn't good. It ended up being stage three colon cancer. I was 37 years old, never been in the hospital other than being born. Woke up, had chest pains, went to the hospital that morning. They gave me a quadruple bypass surgery. Later on, 12 years later, I guess, it was, I had chest pains, went back to the hospital, had bypass surgery again. I became sick with this mysterious illness. One of the doctors, I'm a nurse, uh, I was uh, completing my bachelor's degree and I could barely even think. 
have any memory, uh, short-term memory. One to one infectious disease doctor that um, treats at the hospital where I worked and he basically looked at me and told me I needed to go see a psychiatrist that all my symptoms were in my head. You have to fight tooth and nail to prove why you are actually sick or why you are actually this and that. And then you have to prove that you did not do it to yourself. When I got diagnosed with cancer, they fired me. And that was from a health institution. As time went on, I got worse. I would have to do injections, and injections aren't cheap. Not gonna lie to you guys that one injection that I need to take is $600. And I need to take them um, mostly every Monday, and, it, and it's hard. I can't afford that. And my job, I, I get paid maybe $200 a week. Over 15 doctors that I visited, I found a nurse practitioner, and I came back positive for uh, tick-borne illness. Um, the main one for me was early kiosis, Coxsackie virus, Epstein-Barr, um, parvovirus, and I had quite a bit positive Lyme bands. It's training in healthcare and the lack of training and the lack of empathy. I remember waking up after surgery, then the pain instantaneously kicked in. I'm like, oh my goodness, wow, that hurts. Holy cow, that hurts. They couldn't calm my pain. So they kept giving me different pain meds to try to make it better, and it didn't work. And I said, oh my goodness, what are we doing? What are we doing after different times? Who knows how much it's costing, but they kept giving me different things. And the nurse finally said, well, if we can't calm you down, you're gonna have a heart attack. Once I got to the surgeon, um, we had several meetings, we had the surgery, and he cut a nerve that was very important to your body, the nerve that controls your brain and your GI system. So my GI system no longer works. I lost my 17-year-old daughter to suicide on March 28, 2017. The runarounds that we received so many times throughout her illness, which went on for you know a good six, seven years, was depressing. Um, it was frustrating, and it, it's just not where we need to be. Some of the things that went on, I mean, it began at the beginning with her seeing a psychologist, her seeing a doctor, and of course, you know, was prescribed medication. It never failed um, multiple times that once she would get on a medication that was actually working, insurance would say, well, now you need to change it because it's too expensive. You know, the whole medical merry-go-round went round and round because, you know, this is what we have to do, is we have to fund the medical merry-go-round. I got in debt. It was so much, so much money. Healthcare didn't help me. They left me there like nothing. They said I got rejected because of the fact that I'm diabetic. I was not worth it to the healthcare system to be treated. Went back for my six week checkup, we weren't done. It was in the lymph nodes. So I decided on an aggressive form of treatment, which meant chemo and radiation. And I would go to this facility for in all toll with a surgery about a year's time. It cost a lot. Um, and it cost a lot many times. When you're hitting $10,000 deductibles and your co-pays don't count and you have to pay for labs and you have to pay for x-rays and you go to the pharmacy and you get a medicine that they think is a trial medicine and they tell you your copay is $3,000. Well, at $3,000 you walk away and say, I guess I don't need that medicine or I need it but I'm not, I don't have $3,000 to pay. It's not the $99 or $33 or 189 for a family anymore. People are paying up to $1,500 a month for health care for their whole family. And add that with the rise of housing, you're paying $15,000 to $3,000 a month for housing, depending on what type of housing do you have. So people cannot afford it. Haley was hospitalized many times with suicidal um, attempts. And it was, she was in the hospital, she was in the inpatient for sometimes six to eight weeks. But the minute that you started to see the light come back in her eyes, insurance would say, okay, you're done. It's time for you to get out. These hospitals, mega hospitals, are just raping and pillaging. It's like, what can we get away with? You know, um, how much can we charge this person? As soon as, some, as soon as some physician tells you you have excellent insurance, you should be leaving that office. Supposedly, healthcare is supposed to help you. It's supposed to, you know, help you with anything you can. It's not helping me. It's like making me in debt. 
we move forward in the healthcare system, you know, you know it, you hear it, now it's you. So how do you how do you adapt? How do you how do you get diagnosis? How do you get which path should you take? There's no there's no book for that. I have been from doctor to doctor to doctor. They don't look at the side effects. They don't research anything. It's all just cookbook medicine. One, two, three. If you don't have one of these three things, you're mon more complex. I'm sorry, I don't have time for you. We fought for our daughter. I didn't give up. Um, but there just wasn't enough out there and there wasn't enough resources. So like I said, she was in a place in Maitland, Florida. And um, there's a big, huge list of hospitals. So then you go to your insurance. Okay, which one's on this? And then you find one that's on there. Oh, well, that's for sexually abused children or that's for addicts. And that was not our daughter. Our daughter had mental illness. I didn't want to expose her to any more things. So in March 2017, I found a place in Knoxville, Tennessee, which was, you know, that one step up from what we had been in before. Um, so she was not looking forward to and didn't want to go back to the hospital. So I waited to tell her. I thought, okay, she's at an appointment with her psychologist on Tuesday night. So my husband was going to meet me there. I picked up Haley from, well, I went home to pick up Haley. Um, but she wasn't home. That was the day she went missing. She was missing for 10 days before she was ultimately found and she had taken her own life. Um, but I'll never say suicide took my daughter. Mental illness took my daughter. If we had a healthcare system that was pro-health and we really, we really focused on prevention rather than treating symptoms, our healthcare costs would go down and there would be a lot healthier people walking around the United States. And I ended up having to pay five or six thousand dollars out of pocket. Five or six thousand dollars, not knowing that you're going to have to pay, is uh, kind of cuts into uh, other things in life that you would like to do, and you have to forfeit those to be able to pay. And then you worry about, well, what what does the future hold? What am I going to have wrong with me next? Practically, my whole life, I've been rejected with health care. I've not gotten one single penny, not at all. Seeing people discounted and, and tossed aside. They should be on to their next phase of their life, but they weren't. They needed help, they needed care, they needed somebody to guide them. And people were just giving up. And it was just so disheartening for me to see that because many didn't know what to do. I just, I can't believe that there's not more empathy and more, more care. It's sad that people have to pick health care, food, your housing. It shouldn't even be like that, but that's how it is. Until we start getting more help and more resources for people. I don't know how we're gonna change this epidemic because that's what it's it's turning into. You're almost ready to pay any price, but there becomes a point that you cannot continue. Our congressmen were elected to represent the will of the people. If only it were so simple. And the answer is the greed and corruption of the drug companies. Device of party line companies. politics. Special interest lobbying and bureaucratic entanglement all account for something quite different. If you look at the U.S. healthcare system, in many ways we have the best healthcare system anywhere in the world. Our outcomes at the top, if, if you need high level intensive medicine anywhere in the world, you're gonna look at the United States. It's why people from, from all over the world come here when they need the best healthcare that the world has to offer. You have quality, you have cost, and you have access. We're doing very well on quality. Again, highest quality any available anywhere in the world. The cost is the most expensive healthcare uh, anywhere in the world, driven by, uh, in large part, prescription drugs and, and uh, some of the rules that revolve around the distribution and use of prescription drugs. But on access, uh, we have done better in recent years of making healthcare 
more accessible to people, but there are people who can't afford it. People whose life circumstance doesn't allow them the opportunity to purchase health care insurance for themselves or for their families. And that's a big problem in this country. The folks that don't have health care don't disappear. They still live their lives and they still walk among us in society. There are friends and neighbors and co-workers and members of our families. And when you don't have health care and you get sick, you go to the hospital and you show up and you will get treated. And somebody's going to pay for the cost of that care. You may not pay for it, but somebody is going to pay for it. And that's the unfortunate cost shift that happens when the insurance premiums come in and they're up 12 to 15 percent. Part of the reason for that is because they're covering the costs of the people who can't afford health care on their own. They get treated, but the bill comes to somebody else. I think there are a lot of ethical dilemmas today in health care. I think one is um, the idea that you have to treat everybody and this concept about religion coming into play. As a health care provider myself, when I went to school, we were taught in ethics that you treat everybody. You don't look at who the person is, who they love, what their religion is, what country they came from, any of those things, that this is your ethical obligation to treat everyone the same. And what I'm seeing today is that there are people who are saying, we don't want to treat those thems. I call them the thems, the de them du jour, <laughs> whatever, the, whoever the them happens to be. And that's very scary to me because, um, you know, we have always believed in this country ethically that's part of your code of ethics is that you treat everyone the same. The main idea of profit motive is that people are driven to do things and they're driven to do things for profit and profit doesn't always mean money. Profit can mean uh, leadership, profit can mean extra time with your family, profit can mean you know, a better community. Whatever profit means to you or the individual is something that drives them. So we mainly understand this in the workplace that uh, a business is in business to profit. But what we don't think about is the second level there, that an employee is working for that business to profit themselves. And the profit doesn't usually go along necessarily with the companies. They wanna pay their mortgage, they wanna pay their car bill, they wanna spend time with their family, and that doesn't mean making more money for the business. A manager understands the profit motives of their employees, then they can be a better manager. And so what I do in the book is talk about that, but then we expand it out and we talk about uh, profit motives in media, profit motives in politics, profit motives in healthcare. So profit motives in healthcare are really interesting because the patient is only paying for about 10% of the healthcare they receive, and that's 10 cents on the dollar. So if you went into a grocery store and you were only paying 10 cents on the dollar for whatever you could buy, you would buy a lot more groceries or different groceries. It would change the way that you shop. And in fact, that is what we see in healthcare. People have these gold-plated plans that they don't use much of and don't get the value out of. But since they're only paying 10 cents on the dollar and since the companies get to write it off of their taxes, um, we see this expansion in what we're paying for in healthcare. We have these government regulations that really change uh, the way that the hospitals and the doctors and the practices think about the patients. Because if a patient's only paying 10 cents on the dollar and a hospital's getting reimbursed by the government or an insurance company, then the patient is no longer the client. They're no longer the payer. And so instead of the hospital or the doctor treating the patient, they're thinking of billing and they're thinking of the businesses and they're thinking about the insurance companies. You know, healthcare costs too much. We're having to pay too much because it costs too much. We're, you know, we're perhaps using it too often or not using it correctly. There's a lot of focus now on the drug companies and drug prices are of course very, very high and something clearly needs to be done about it. When drug companies are only funding five to 10% of, of, of your, your budget, it's a lot easier to speak out about something than when they're, they're um, paying a far higher amount. They say that they represent patients, consumers, but they never say anything about drug prices because they're getting so much money from the drug companies. The other things that was resonated for me the most when I started covering healthcare was seeing the list of the countries that spend the most on healthcare and the countries that have the sickest people. And we spend the most, and among the developed 
developed countries, we have the sickest people. So, so there's got to be a better way to do it. And one of the things the other countries are doing much better is offering social services. Profit motive is really broken in healthcare because what you want is a doctor-patient relationship where the patient is the client and therefore the hospital and the insurance company and the employer are all focused on treating the patient. And in this case, they're not. They're all focused on saving money for whoever the payer is. The number of times you go to the doctor, the number of tests and services that they order and that they run, the more often they're paid. And there was no incentive to keep costs down because the, the more treatment you provide, the more you're going to be paid. We are moving away from that. We're moving to a value-based reimbursement society where you're expected to provide high quality care at the lowest possible cost. Currently, when, when you go to the doctor and you end up having a surgery, you'll get seven different bills in the mail. You'll get one from the surgeon, one from the primary care physician, one from the anesthesiologist, one from the people who took your blood, one from the expert on and on it goes. Uh, and in the past, they haven't coordinated as well as they possibly could have. So there was a lack of coordination, a lack of cost control, and again, no incentive to keep costs down because you're reimbursed based upon the volume of care, not, not the quality of care. So the way you solve the problem of cost, in part, is by cracking that part of the system, getting in to value-based arrangements where people, physicians, providers, are reimbursed based upon the quality of care, not the quantity of care that's offered. People have taken a step back to think, well, I'm more comfortable with government intervention in the healthcare system because none of those bad things I was told were going to happen have actually happened. So the debate today is framed by a much greater acceptance in the public of government intervention in the healthcare system. So when a candidate talks about Medicare for all or single payer healthcare system, there are policy implications to that when you dig deeper that may concern the public, but the theory of it is not nearly as concerning to the public as it has been in the past. Regulatory capture is an economic theory that was put forward by George Stiegler in 1971, Nobel Prize winning economist, and he argued that it was possible within a regulated environment for the industry that was being regulated to control the regulatory authority. So the theory of regulatory capture is exactly that, that you have entities that are being regulated that through campaign contributions, through political and other public activities, gain a dominance within the regulatory authority over which they're being regulated. Regulatory capture in the healthcare industry would involve, let's say, the prescription drug market, where the Food and Drug Administration looks first to the pharmaceutical companies and asks their opinion of things before they make a determination on, on drugs. Uh, the, the same would go for healthcare providers. And, um, you know, the issue with the theory of regulatory capture is, I think, the view that in all cases it's going to lead to bad outcomes. You have people who are making decisions that are not in the public's best interest based upon an industry dominance of the regulatory body. I get asked all the time from my experience in Washington, what are the most powerful lobbying groups that you see in Washington? And clearly the gun industry, the Israel lobby, the AARP, the seniors lobby, they're all in and of themselves very powerful, but as a group, as an industry, no group yields more power or participates more forcefully in the advocacy process than the healthcare industry. You have the pharmaceutical companies, Big Pharma, you have the generic uh, drug makers, you have the pharmaceutical distributors, you have the hospitals, you have the physicians, you have the medical device industry, you have consumers, you have all sides. There are probably hundreds of people sitting around their kitchen tables all across the country with the bills out looking at their health care expenses thinking about what it means for them it's the largest driver of bankruptcies of any issue in the country 20 percent of our GDP goes to health care the money that's involved in health care in this country leads to a huge public discussion about the future of our health care system the problem with the perception people have of lobbying within the health care industry is the money that gets spent to influence outcomes and that's when you run into the danger of not having the most effective outcome I think we need very strong leadership in some of these areas, just basic things that we used to do that we're not doing anymore. Why? 
um, you know, if they get sick, if the thems get sick, they expose the us's to getting sick. And that's not really looked at today anymore. So I think we need, you know, some strong leadership in, in Washington. People to speak out the way they used to speak out and say this just isn't right. In the Senate, most of the senators have issue-driven staffers. So they'll have somebody dedicated solely to health care, somebody dedicated solely to taxes, somebody dedicated solely to foreign affairs. In the House, generally, there are three people with a portfolio of issues. Domestic policy, which includes health care, education, social security, those issues. A budget person that looks at budget and taxes, and a foreign affairs person that looks at the military and trade and foreign affairs issues. And the problem is there's sometimes a lack of coordination between the policies because when you deal with health care, you're dealing with the tax system in this country. You're not just dealing with the providing health care, you're dealing with how you pay for it as well. And if the congressional office doesn't deal with that well, they lose part of that debate. And that's why it's so difficult to have health care reform discussed in those silos of how are we going to pay for it, what's the level of care and what's the quality of care. You really do have to look at it all together and that's difficult to do with an issue that's as big as health care. I'm here in McLean surrounded by um, some of the biggest, most expensive houses you've ever seen and they're owned by, they're owned by people who are lobbyists so there's a lot of corporate interest uh, at, at play here. Even if you don't care about these people, you are paying for them and economically it doesn't make sense for them to not have care, covered care. If you don't have the support of the American people behind you, it is going to be very difficult to pass legislation. When people come in and you as a, the people who are setting the budget for the country, it's a zero-sum game. And you have to decide this year, are we going to spend more money on MS or Alzheimer's or cancer? or HIV, or diabetes, or heart disease. How are we going to spread that money around? And that is so powerful, and that's why healthcare is unique. And for all the money that's spent on lobbying in this country, that's what wins the day. It's not money, it's the face of the people that are impacted by healthcare the most. With over a trillion dollar deficit and a national debt exceeding $23 trillion, can the economy withstand the cost of universal health care with unchecked spending? My name's Carl Ash. I'm a, a PhD economist. I've been working in uh, health care economics for all of my career. A lot of us endure what I call is financial toxicity. Health care in itself is very expensive in our country and I am not always confident that it's being spent in the most appropriate manner. The United States spent roughly 3.65 trillion dollars on health care services which represents a 4.4 percent increase from the year before in 2017. The quality of health care and related services are they justified by the costs? My name is Ken Keyes, and I'm a tax lawyer in Washington, D.C. One might wonder, as you, as you think about what we do in healthcare currently, and Social Security and so on, what about the debt we already have accrued? For millennials in particular, the $23 trillion total government debt that we currently have should be alarming because we're adding about a trillion a year to it. And the problem is, at the, at the political level, Almost no one is talking about it anymore. And to me, that's more alarming than ever. And it's both Democrats and Republicans. It's as if it doesn't exist. And yet, uh, for young people, the millennial generation, they're being stuck with it. That's a big change from, say, when I was at the Joint Committee in 97, and we did the 97 budget deal, which was a bipartisan deal between Bill Clinton, a Democrat president, Newt Gingrich, the Republican Speaker of the House, did a deal uh, we balanced the budget and paid off half a trillion of debt by 9-11, 2001. Most people can't even imagine paying off any debt at this point. And so we're adding a trillion a year under our current spending levels. So when we think about spending more at the federal government level, no matter what you're talking about, you have to realize we already have an enormous debt and it, it should be something that scares everyone. 
What's the bad news for millennials who are concerned about paying $1,000 a month for health insurance? The bad news is most people like their health insurance because they like health care. What other countries have done to lower costs is something that Americans are not prepared to do, which is ration health care. That's what the UK does. That's what Canada does. Americans have come to really expect that they're going to have health care relatively on demand. They don't like sitting in mer emergency rooms waiting. It it's a real dilemma that we face uh, because we like what we have, but we don't like what we're paying for it. Um, so the question is, do we want to give up what we have or do, do we want to find somebody else to pay for it? And the problem is somebody else is going to be the millennials too because it's going to come in the form of taxes. For employers, providing health insurance is a deductible expense, which of course makes sense because it's part of the cost of employing people. So there's a lot of interactions with the tax system, both individual income tax and corporate tax that are relate to the, the health insurance system that we have. Corporate taxes only produce about 200 billion a year of revenues uh, out of uh, multiple trillions that we collect. Our tax system basically collects money from individuals in the form of social security taxes and income taxes. That's where most of the money comes from. The estate tax, which gets a lot of attention because it's a tax on people when they're wealthy and die, it doesn't produce that much money either. There are no easy answers here in terms of changing the status quo to something that's more acceptable because people like their health care. Modern monetary theory, in a nutshell, says that the government can print as much currency as it wants and there will never be any net effect on purchasing power of that currency, meaning that lots of free stuff can be promised to everyone, whether it be college, medical services, jobs, food, housing, and anything else the general populace demands from the government. So if they print 100 currency units, they just tax the rich the same amount. So 100 goes in and 100 comes out. In their way of thinking, it's a simple transaction and the net cost is a wash. However, history tells us this is never what happens. Every flat currency in the world in the course of the last 100 years that disappeared suffered its demise because of this very theory. This can be summed up that there is a limited amount of wealth but an unlimited number of currency units. Modern monetary theory is the road being paved to economic health. You know, there's a lot of proposals that are being made by various presidential candidates to expand the role of government in healthcare, for example. And so that does raise a question of, um, do we have to worry about what government's already providing and can we afford it? The Social Security system, for example, uh, we know by about 2032 or 2033, which isn't that far away, is gonna hit a point where there's no reserves left in the Social Security Trust Fund and incoming taxes will only be adequate to pay 70% of benefits. Now that's a horrific thought, that we're gonna cut Social Security benefits 30%. That's just not gonna happen. So we already know that we have other demands that we're gonna to have to fund one way or another without expanding existing programs. That's part of what we have to think about as we consider whether to, for example, expand health care that's provided by the federal government. Because we already know that we have obligations staring us in the face within a decade or so that are going to demand enormous resources. A reasonable question one might pose is, can we improve the health care system by taking money that we're spent, already spending at the federal government level and, and spend it on health care rather than where we're spending it currently? If you walk out and interview 20 people on the street, and say, where should we cut spending? They will all say, get rid of foreign aid. Foreign aid represents such a minor part of federal government spending that it was, it's barely a blip in terms of the total that the federal government spends. You have to realize what the federal government is. It's an insurance company with an army. And when I say that, what I mean is, the three biggest pieces of the federal government are Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and defense. You add interest on the national debt, and you have 80%, 90% of total federal government spending. So what that means is, if you want to reallocate, you would have to take money from defense and spend it on health care, because that's where the money is. Everything else is small potatoes. 
coverage of health care in the context of the 2020 Democratic presidential campaign amounts to asking a yes or no question about support for Medicare for All. The Medicare for All crowd accuses the others of uh, being incrementalists and the Medicare for All critics say that this is the pie in the sky stuff that won't work. What's missing here is any deep analysis of the cost and feasibility of Medicare for All and more important what some of the alternatives might look like. So unless the uh, candidates can get beyond the talking points and connect their plans to these uh, pocketbook concerns, any plan will have trade-offs and landmines. More health care costs more and we have to decide how to pay for it. The thing about health care also, that, that people like the health care they have, they expect to get it. And you might say, well, we're spending too much money on health care. That's a pretty common notion that you hear. The rest of the world spends 15% on health care, 10% on health care. Why are we spending 20%? Well, it's one way to spend our money. We could be spending it on alcohol, which I'm okay with. It's not the worst thing in the world to be spending money on, which is to provide good health care. And there's a reason Many people around the world come to the United States, to the Cleveland Clinic, to Mayo, to you name it. It's because we provide the best health care in the world. Um, so there, there, there are reasons that the current system actually has a lot to be said for it. It is clear that the health care system in the United States needs to change in the future to limit spending while maintaining quality and expanding access. For us to get to the point where we can show the impact of a alternate payment plan, uh, improving our economy and, our, and the quality of care for our patients, we need better data. A lot of these proposals are wonderful in the sense that they offer us uh, hope that uh, money will be saved, but at the end of the day, I'm, I still worry about the quality of care. Affordable health care, as I understand it, is uh, something we all aspire towards. The path getting there is convoluted. The sheer magnitude of what we're experiencing now, which is roughly $3.65 trillion, is daunting in itself. These facts speak for themselves. We have a real issue here. Imagine that we were to experience another ramp up in interest rates like we experienced in the 1980 period, which by the way happened in like a two year period. It would mean our, our borrowing costs would triple, but nobody seems to care. And people keep talking about inflation as being a consequence of this, and yet inflation has been astonishingly low for a number of years now. But I personally believe that there is a point out there, and I don't know where it is, or when it's gonna happen, when there's gonna be a consequence to all of this. It just seems to me you can't borrow this kind of money indefinitely without having some significant impact. There's a storm brewing and quite honestly, we can't afford this. It's totally out of control, it's crazy. One of the things when, when I started uh, covering the Affordable Care Act and through now, um, one of the things I've noticed is that just as it's wonderful that the people in downtown Washington where I um, work with uh, kids of color teaching them health reporting, just as they have insurance now, it's not doing as much for them as it should be doing, just as the people that I hear from all the time who are self-employed say it's not doing enough for them. They might as well have catastrophic insurance. They can't afford to go to the doctor. You know, Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, has had a real uh, significant impact on people. People don't have to worry about not being insured. I don't think I know anybody who doesn't have a pre-existing condition. I mean, in my world with people with disabilities, there are a lot of people with disabilities who, if they didn't have Medicaid or Medicare, would not have coverage for, say, they need a new wheelchair, or they need physical or occupational therapy because maybe something is becoming weaker, or, you know, there's something that needs to be fine-tuned. Politically, uh, I, I listen to a lot of people talk about Medicare for All. I don't think there's enough people that are willing to give up their commercial insurance that they like. I happen to have commercial insurance that I like. I don't love the network, but I like it. And if, the, I, if I were to have fewer choices, I'd be very unhappy of doctors. So I do, I, I think there's a tremendous benefit in having having everybody, particularly the less fortunate and the sicker, have access to health care that is affordable, if not free, is great. There is a lack of understanding about health care and payment options. Every time I hear Medicare for All, I get a little scared because 
There's a difference between Medicare and Medicaid. The financing end is one, but I'm, I'm most interested in the services provided. So for example, Medicaid provides a whole slew of services for people with disabilities that Medicare doesn't. And the idea of getting rid of Medicaid and giving everyone Medicare doesn't help a lot of the people I serve. So for example, if you have a spinal cord injury and you need someone to get you out of bed in the morning so you can go to work and someone to put you to bed at night so that you can go back to sleep, Medicaid covers those kinds of services. Someone to come in and, and you know cook a couple of meals, get you ready for the day, um, that's covered. Help you get your medication, help transfer you from your wheelchair to the bed. Those things are covered. They're not covered under Medicare. So getting rid of Medicaid and putting it into Medicare is scary because a lot of services are going to go away. Um, if you have a job and you need someone to come and catheterize you at work, Medicaid will pay for that if you're within a certain income bracket or if you can buy into Medicaid. There's a special program that lets you buy into Medicaid. So if you get a job, and depending on the state, I'm not going to get into the weeds, but there are certain requirements, you can keep Medicaid, pay for it, buy into it, so that you have this independence and in services. Medicare for All not, doesn't cover that, so it kind of scares me when they talk about Medicare for All that it doesn't look at the weeds, it looks at the clouds. People that, that are paying a lot of money out of pocket every month and these crazy high deductibles, it is like catastrophic insurance. It's hard to convince people, particularly young people, that you really need it in case you get cancer or one of these other awful diseases. And this really is better than it was when, you know, before the Afford Affordable Care Act where people that had cancer, as an example, um, couldn't get insurance. There's got to be a better solution. It has to be something where insurance is more affordable and doctors are willing to take the insurance. The young people and their parents in Washington who I, I work with, you know, it's almost impossible for them to find a mental health provider. I have friends that are um, in their 50s who just lost their primary care doctors here in McLean, Virginia, or Great Falls, an even wealthier town next door. Their doctors have now gone concierge, so they wanted to find a regular doctor that takes their insurance, and they cannot find a doctor that will take them, and they're perfectly healthy. The Department of Health and Human Services is trying out some, some interesting possibilities, how to bring the cost of health care down while making people healthier, but boy, it's very slow going. Wouldn't it be nice if there were a way to save money while also bypassing bureaucracy and improving the provider-patient relationship? So I've been advocating for free market healthcare for a long time. And in that time, I have had a uh, congressional uh, healthcare. I've had a, a healthcare plan that was provided to me by the state of Florida. I had one from the National Center for Policy Analysis. And now I run my own business and I had a great plan there. Obamacare passed and um, I had a worse plan that cost more money and I've slowly been getting a worse plan that cost more money. And then I looked around and said, I've been advocating for free market healthcare for 10 years. These healthcare sharing ministries, I've heard the good stories about them. I've seen them doing good things. So I actually joined one last year and it's been interesting. I um, I still think it's the wild west. It's an emerging market. The frontiersmen were called frontiersmen for a reason. They were, they were out on the edge doing something. But when you look at the economics behind them, the economics is solid. If you look at their books, the books are solid. If you read stories on the way that um, they've paid for patients, they're all solid. And in fact, it's one of the biggest things in this market is that they all don't want anybody to mess up because since it's cutting edge and since it's a little different than the being a Blue Cross and Blue Shield member, they don't want anybody to have a problem. And so they're all kind of working together to make sure 
that the system works for people. And so I've had a great experience being on it. There's a learning curve because you have to unlearn some of the things that you have been used to from insurance, but it's wild. Even the people that work at the offices are kind of amazed at the prices that you end up getting because you're paying cash. It's really kind of a good feeling to push the healthcare system ourselves while being uh, insured in, in some form of fashion. Obamacare helped sick people access coverage that they maybe couldn't have in certain cases, which is kind of a lie, because before Obamacare, most people who were sick could get care. It might have been a bit more expensive and run by the state government. It's called a, a reinsurance pool for the sick, uninsured pool. And otherwise, if you are somewhat healthy, your private insurance on the individual state level is pretty affordable. And Medicaid was there for the poor, Medicare for the old and disabled. We had a pretty good system. Now it's a pretty good system for the people who are really sick. Their premiums are subsidized a bit. For the vast upper middle class, they're getting hurt by having to pay what effectively is a mortgage for health care. So they're either leaving insurance as a million people have for sharing to get coverage that's affordable, or they're going uninsured, which is risky. I don't know what they're doing to qualify for a subsidy on the exchange, but if you don't have a subsidy, you're paying over a grand a month in health care and then the several thousand dollars in deductible. So effectively, you have become a cash pay patient because it's hard to reach $5,000, $10,000 of a deductible. Most people don't get that sick. You know, 10% of Americans spend three grand of health care a year. So those who use it are sick and need it. They need the help. The vast majority need something cheaper less comprehensive. Just make sure you don't go bankrupt from cancer, a heart attack, or a bad accident. You can pay little and have that protection. It doesn't prepay for things you might want, but there's trade-offs in life. My name is Jeff Cantor. I'm the founder of YourFreedomHub.com, and we are a disruptor in the freedom industry. So we're also involved in healthcare and a variety of other areas, all about freedom for individuals. What we're able to do is provide you an assistant, as it were, so you've got an expert in the field to be your helper. So if you're a member with us, as an example, you just call a simple phone number, and you're talking to a health expert who can help you figure out how to get a better pricing on an MRI, find a different doctor, shop around for surgeries. Because again, you probably don't know how to do that, you don't have the time for one, you don't have the interest in learning any of that stuff, but you want the solution. So we're going to give you a fast way to get to the most proper solution possible. A million people who are fairly well-to-do or, or even of modest income have left insurance for sharing. They've bit the bullet, they're happy, they're accessing the same doctors in the hospital, but they're just paying half as much, so they're happy. Then there are those who like the idea of becoming a cash patient. You, you'll see for primary care what are called direct primary care practices prolif proliferating nationwide. And especially if you're kind of a high user of health care, if you have a lot of meds, if you're a chronically diseased person, you're going to go in a lot. Pay to pay that monthly fee of a 75 bucks or 100 bucks. Your primary care physician will give you unlimited or low-cost care. He has access, or she has access to labs, tests, good recommendations, 24-hour access for the kids when they have the cold in the middle of the night. That's a great innovation in the market. DPC. We'll cut the cost if you're catastrophic in half, and we'll also double your money in a spending account, called a medical spending account, for the low-level stuff that you know you're going to have. If you're going to have maintenance meds, you want to go to the chiropractor more often. There's now a Forbes-featured medical spending account that doubles your money over three years, effectively making all your out-of-pocket 50% less. So Health Excellence Plus is the name of that solution, where not necessarily the primary care part, but the sharing for the expensive stuff and the account for your first dollar discretionary stuff is pretty cheap for 400 300 a month. So that's going to make people's eyes open up and we make you into a cash payer. So now there's no networks. We didn't even talk about how insurers handcuff you with networks that exclude the best doctors or hospitals. That's something that we're definitely telling people about. It's not just your price, it's also the handcuffs and networks. We make into a cash payer so there's no networks and there's no need for networks. We'll help you shop nationwide, wherever you want to go to. Medical tourism internationally. More natural care where a lot of folks want to go. Health Excellence Plus is to plan for the individual, family, or small business person in open enrollment to cut your costs in half, become a cash shopping patient, and really take control of this awful health system. The question oftentimes is how important is it to be a cash payer? 
and the reality is it's very important. The market understands pricing signals. Everyone's familiar with going to a corner where there's a gas station on every corner and they're all fighting for that price. So I get to see the pricing signals and I know where to go. Same thing when it comes to medical care. If I don't understand what anything costs, all I'm worried about is what's my copay. So the idea of cash is that the whole program and anything I'm going to have done is all defined down to one set price. So I can decide as a consumer which is the place I want to patronize and without a pricing signal I'm never going to know that. So being a cash payer is mission critical to the success of healthcare in America. We call it medical cost sharing. Uh, oftentimes under the concept of sharing, it's more of a religious approach. But realistically, it's a very old mentality of how to deal with things. It's everybody pooling their resources. A common occurrence is to talk about the Amish. Because in the Amish community, they don't really have insurance. Because let's say your barn burns down, tomorrow every neighbor shows up to build you a new barn. So the same thing with the community of medical cost sharing is everybody's pooled their financial resources. So if anybody within that community actually has a medical expense, we're going to be able to make sure that that's met. And it's the most effective methodology because it's very ethical and it's very inexpensive by comparison because you're not layering it up with a lot of added costs and stuff built in there for no good reason, just to pump up the price. It's like any little cartel that formulates over time. You know, if you can kind of get control of an industry and then there's only a couple players after a while, they tend to start to collude together. Whenever any cartel formulates, its sole goal is monopolization of what's going on and to thwart anybody entering that market. And invariably, they've got the participation of government when it comes to that because they have lobbyists and they patronize them as far as like getting you know votes or giving them money for campaigns. And in return, they're going to help pass those regulations that they're seeking. So it's definitely a fixed little world. Uh, have you ever heard someone say, have you considered sharing? Well, it's half the cost of insurance. It's the third way in politics, too. And you know what? It's not new. It's 100 years old. It's mutual aid. Most folks before World War II got their health care through groups that they belonged to. And they paid a monthly fee. They had a kitty to pay all the bills. Sometimes they had an in-house doctor. It was part of lodge systems they belonged to. We're engaged in a big change, taking on the cartel where 90% of people get their health care through insurance companies that they don't, they don't like. We are here to empower patients and to give them more choices so that we can save this market and make it better, not con more controlled and worse. The advantages of being a cash pay patient are actually kind of almost hysterical if other people weren't getting taken advantage of by the system. But like if you go to Keith Smith's Oklahoma Surgery Center, you'll pay about 10% of what you would pay at the hospital down the street. And that's just because he doesn't have a full billing staff that he has to hire. He doesn't have to wait 90 to 180 days for payment and then not be sure if he's going to get the payment. And because of this system where he can get payment now, he can even negotiate. So instead of getting paid in cash, he's gotten paid in Bitcoin. It's kind of an exciting thing in healthcare to see when you're paying with cash, what what changes. And um, even going to your normal doctor's office, you can see price cuts of you know anywhere from 10% to 90% on different procedures or office visits. I mean, the goal also is about your wealth, right? I mean, in reality, there's two important things in your world, your health and your wealth. You need both of those. Everything else kind of builds off of those. So when it comes to your wealth, there's a lot of areas that you need to think about. My personal finances, my cost of health care, how much I spend. Where do I get the money to pay for all those things? So we've got a few different mechanisms. In the healthcare world, most people are understanding the idea of a health savings account. And so we're able to help you with those too, where you can actually get money invested. Most people just have it set aside. They take a little tax break, but they're not growing that money. And, and the government's giving you permission to grow that money. So we're gonna help them understand how they can grow dollars in a health savings account. But then also we have a medical benefit savings account, which as Charles was mentioning, allows you to double your dollars and even more to pay for first dollar medical expense. Because that's the challenge for a lot of people. I've got my insurance or whatever it may be if something bad happens. But you know what? I have a lot of other independent things I have to spend money on. Where does that money come from? And so that's another area we want to address to make sure that you're covered in terms of where you're going to provide for yourself from one extreme to the other. Now, when we look out into the long run, what we need is a patient-doctor relationship, a doctor-patient relationship. And the way that we do that is by giving the patient the power, making the patient the payer. So 
health savings accounts are really the primary solution for that. John Goodman um, wants to make them Roth health savings accounts, which makes them post-tax dollars. And that is a way to further make uh, healthcare money more equal to other money. And so really when you get into the economics of healthcare spending, instead of having cheap dollars for healthcare, you should have the a choice between healthcare savings and buying should all be equal. Within the healthcare industry, I have uh, created a distribution system for a cash-based uh, platform that really enables the free market system to sort of begin to change things from a system right now that doesn't work very well for, for patients uh, or providers. So what our program does is it takes a technology that is very inclusive and acts as a platform which allows physicians to receive cash payments for medical services that they decide how much they'd like for them to cost and allows them to put their services really onto a free market type of platform. We go to employers and we say, let us talk to your employees about making sure that whatever doctors that they'd like to see on that platform be on there. Then we set up a system that lets them pay cash for everything that they might need as a healthcare consumer except for hospitalizations and emergencies, which is really the only thing that you need a catastrophic insurance plan for. I still believe in a place called... Going back to 1990, when Bill Clinton becomes president and his wife tried to take over the healthcare system by shoving everyone into HMOs with Medicare pricing controls, that woke me up and a lot of folks to the alternative, which is to open markets to allow supply to expand and prices to come down and options to expand and people to shop around like any other market and get what they want, whether it's allopath, natural, here, overseas. So we work with uh, all the innovators, both in politics and in entrepreneurship, namely healthcare disruption, with various uh, events like weekly podcasts where we give the cash patients that we create some examples of the best doctors and hospitals and integrated therapists that are accessible to them because we make them cash payers and that is the secret niche in this debate that is not discussed anywhere. If you don't create cash payers and help them shop around, you can't have a supply and demand in a market. The demand is flat, it's horrible. People are right now are slapping down third party insurance cards and expecting someone else to pay for it. That's unsustainable. You can't have smart others running a market. You have to run the market. We give you the cash to shop around. And then politically, as people educate themselves paying cash to save money and learn about choices, they start to be suspicious of the people in control who are telling them they can't access a life-saving drug or a natural therapy or go overseas or see this kind of payment company, et cetera, et cetera. There's so much information out there. We don't know who to trust, but they trust their benefits broker. So benefits brokers are really, and a lot of people are saying this, are the key to really helping mobilize this free market system that's out there. And so we seek to work with folks that are in that arena. All the big healthcare systems, they want to be the center of excellence, but they're gonna, you know, at some point come to a reckoning where they realize that they've got to become much more consumer friendly and pay attention to all the things that other industries have had to pay attention to as well. You know, we're not trying to, you know, cut anybody out. We just have a system that arranges for anyone who can add value, bring the things that consumers need and want to, to really stay as healthy as possible. There's plenty of room for them if they're doing the right things. One of the things we see on Capitol Hill is actually something that the founders set up, and that's that it's actually hard to pass a, a law. It's hard to pass a bill. We have the House, and the House is representative. They're called representatives, but it's representative of the country. The house is hot, it's the teacup. You never know what's gonna come out of it and you never know what they're going to say, but they're representative of the country at large. And then you have the Senate and the Senate is the tea saucer. So it sits below the hot tea. And so when the hot tea spills out into the Senate, it's the cooling place. So in the Senate, 
one senator can stand up and stop a bill. And that I think is an important thing for the country because that means that uh, the minority is always represented, but it can be frustrating when we wanna pass a bill. We want something to pass now, but one senator can stand up and stop it. All of the senators have to understand how important a free market healthcare is, how important a functioning healthcare market is for it to work. People are typically very smart. Oftentimes I've had dealings and I've been in the industry over 30 years and I've had dealings with you know, some inner city areas. And the, and the person in that area may not be a highly educated person as far as like book learned, but the reality is that they're extremely smart when it comes to common sense. So that's a universal trait most people have across all spectrums and colors and ages and whatever it may be, if you allow that to occur. And so that's what's been the passion is how do we get more autonomy and freedom into all markets and the most egregious by far is health. So that's really kind of the low hanging fruit because it affects everybody. Everybody's going to get sick at one point. And if that's not a, if that's not a free market, we're all going to suffer. Your health is going to be affected one way or another. And you would think it would be really important for people to pay attention to that. And sadly they don't. So we're here to stimulate traffic, to get people to become more aware. And frankly, when everybody does become aware, they get more involved. And what that's doing is building the grassroots information of what's going on in the system. The more people that are MediShare members, healthcare sharing members, the more people that go to a DPC practice, the more voters understand about what's going on, the more Congress will listen. So when you look at a staffer, they're 28 years old, they don't make much money, um, they're up working in the Capitol to make America a better place, but the people that are coming into the office that might offer them a better future happen to be the lobbyists for the hospitals and the big healthcare providers. Those are the people that come in with the money. So if you're a staffer and you're looking to help somebody, are you going to help a sharing plan that only has one lobbyist on Capitol Hill that isn't paid the same as, you know, the middle Blue Cross and Blue Shield lobbyist. Their profit motive is to help the big healthcare providers more. So what we have to do is change the grassroots. We have to educate voters. We have to change the marketplace. And I think that we're on our way to that, but it's going to be a long road before we get all the way there. I started covering Washington the year that Reagan got inaugurated and, and Tip O'Neill was a Speaker of the House. I used to know President Reagan's chief speechwriter and I knew Tip O'Neill's press secretary, Chris Matthews, and President Reagan used to get together and they got along, they disagreed. It's very sad that that doesn't happen anymore. And I, I find it really unfortunate that we're not seeking a middle ground, but I do see promise and I see things like the Koch brothers have a foundation stand together that's working on health, education, Education, criminal justice reform. More people just need to realize there are ways to solve the problem by working together. It doesn't have to be so divisive. Inefficiencies in the healthcare system are avoidable. What if there was a way to predict risk, promote prevention, coordinate complex care, and consolidate medical records at the same time? Well, now there is. My name is Paul Roberts, and I'm the owner of Roberts Consulting, which is a medical case management firm. I've been a medical case manager and RN for about 20 years. Over that time, the, those 20 years, it taught me what's really important which is patient advocacy. A lot of times, insurance companies want to cut costs. They want to cut corners. But my view of things is we're nurses. We went into nursing because we care about people. I've seen the problems with the current healthcare system, have been able to develop an alternative healthcare plan 
to the current mainstream healthcare in the country. I call the plan Coordinated Care for All, and the parts of the plan include prediction, education, prevention, efficiency, and cost containment. Starting with prediction, it's now possible to look at genetics, family history, and current medical status and integrate those in a functional way to predict outcomes and risk. Education is important because patients need to understand how to prevent a condition and also the deterioration of that condition. Prevention is important because obviously you need to make sure that a certain condition or at least a deterioration of a condition doesn't progress. You can provide the education and you can have a focus on prevention, but it doesn't necessarily mean that someone will do it. We know there are a lot of competing forces and motivational factors. We have to account for that. So my plan is not something that says we expect everybody to follow this prevention protocol. So there's really a couple different kinds of case management. There's telephonic case management, a medical case manager, an RN, is on the telephone, they're coordinating care, kind of behind the scenes. And then there's also what's called field case management. With field case management, you're actually going out into the community on site with the doctor and the patient. Field case management is actually useful in more complex and catastrophic cases. Medical case management is usually reserved for people that have some condition that is advanced or requires that kind of coordination. One of the primary roles of a medical case manager is to coordinate medical care. A lot of times, a person's medical care is very complex and they can't handle it on their own and they need someone to advocate and do that for them. A medical case manager, a registered nurse, is in a position to understand the medical side of things and make sure things don't slip through the cracks, that everybody's on the same page, things happen and they get coordinated. If you don't have medical case management, a lot of times what can happen is you get a a delay in treatment, there's misunderstandings, miscommunications. I think that RNs are good at conveying information to a patient because for one thing they care and because they understand what's going on all, from a medical side but also really from an uh, interpersonal side. A lot of times medical cases they're handled by an adjuster or what's called a claims examiner. This is somebody that they're great but they don't necessarily understand the medical side of things. And they administer the claim, they pay the benefits, and all the stuff that goes along with that. But they don't necessarily understand the medical terminology or even what's going on medically. It helps to have somebody with medical training in the middle to collaborate and interpret that information. RNs understand a wider breadth across a larger spectrum of the healthcare field. They're used to dealing with the best doctors, some of the best ancillary treatment, for example, physical therapy, uh, the doctor orders an MRI, that's gotta happen somewhere. So a medical case manager understands the best resources for that. RNs also know the most efficient pathways to recovery. They can also identify when there's overutilization. The identification of overutilization is helpful because you're flagging when something is used too much. And you're not making a decision on the use, you're simply identifying it. And then another doctor, an MD, would have say over whether or not something is actually overutilized. And so developing this healthcare plan, I realized we have something that's so important to use and it's just underutilized. The idea that I had was, let's expand that. Let's broaden medical case management to the entire healthcare sector. 
With a case manager, you have people who, by definition of managing your care, of working with the physician, of working with all the specialists that you see, and trying to keep you well and healthy and out of the system so that you make good decisions. And that extends not just from the doctor's office or the hospital setting, but to your home as well, helping you maintain your chronic health condition, if that's the situation, helping you stay healthy if you've had a condition in the past, and working with the insurance company to make sure that the billing that goes along with that is as clean as it can possibly be. I am a medical case manager and I can tell you a story that happened this week. <laughs> it's an amazing service. Um, I have friends that live in the Washington DC metro area. I came from Miami after living there many years and their mother was really, really sick and she's like 96. And she was going to doctor's appointments. She didn't know what was happening to her at those doctor's appointments. And so I called a friend of mine who's a, a case manager and I got them together. I made a marriage. And now this woman is, I, I think she's gonna live another 10 years <laughs> uh, past 100. Her blood counts were off. They were all over the place. And the case manager was able to go in there and look at the history and say to the doctor, well, what are you doing about this? You know, you, got, you tell her to come back in two weeks, you test it, it's off again. What's the plan? And now there's a plan. And there's a plan for her whole life. We're looking at the house, the house, you know, certain things, getting rid of throw rugs so she doesn't fall. We're looking at prevention. We're looking at her whole situation and looking at what her individual needs are. And that, in a nutshell, is case management. It's what does this person need? How can we get it for her? And how can we make her life better? When we uh, have the orders for, let's say, upcoming surgery, we'll need a pre-op clearance, we'll need labs, chest x-rays, maybe an MRI, CT. Giving all that information, giving the orders directly to case management representative, and they have a direct line of communication that those orders can get to that person in more an efficient uh, process, and that way that can be expedited. Most people want to do the right thing, but they just have a hard time doing it. I get too busy. You know, it's like a New Year's resolution. I'm real good for a week or so, and then the next thing you know, I'm back to eating Fritos. You need someone that's gonna help keep you on track and kind of hold your hand and kind of, you know, every time you start to roll off course, it'll just pop you back on there. Case management, that's a big part of healthcare. We manage people as cash payers. We tell you to go pay cash and you have a discount. That's all we want you to do, because most people are so controlled by the third party system, they don't know how to be cash payers or cash shoppers. We discover that through operations in life. So we give them a concierge to hold their hand. Prevention is the key to the whole thing, because keeping people healthy and well and out of the healthcare system is the ultimate way to prevent healthcare costs from going up, because if you're not utilizing the services, there's nothing to pay for. So you're not paying for the services except for your insurance, you know, the, the, the prevention side is keeping you out of the system. And it's like going over Niagara Falls, right? If you stop somebody from going over the falls, you have saved a lot of bad things from happening. Once they've already gone over the falls, you clean up the mess and that's a lot different circumstance. So if you prevent people from getting sick, if you help people with chronic health care conditions to manage and maintain rather than getting very sick because of those, those health issues, you're most importantly going to improve the quality of life for people. That ultimately is what's most important. But you're also going to save a ton of money because you're not going to be providing those services. Medical records are strewn about, it's fragmented. As a case manager, it's hard to get medical records in a timely way for treatment and coordination of care. So by consolidating medical records, we're really improving efficiency. Telemedicine as a part of this efficiency model makes sense because a lot of folks just don't have access. If someone is living out in a rural area, maybe they only have access to one provider. But with telemedicine, you're giving them access to many providers. Telemedicine is definitely an important adjunct and uh, our organization uh, offers telemedicine. It's also especially help, helpful for behavioral health. It's a very important, very important adjunct and it, it allows medical care to be delivered to people who might not otherwise uh, have health care. And for instance, uh, think of a health visitor who's visiting a poor family in a rural, a rural area. They can't travel into the center where the physician is and it's probably not financially viable for the physician to make a house call 50 miles out into the country. But the health visitor can go 
They can set up their video camera so that the physician can see the patient, the patient can see them. They have a stethoscope so the physician can listen to the patient's heartbeat. I think telemedicine offers tremendous possibilities in healthcare. You can't even find a psychiatrist or a psychologist that will take you if you're paying out of pocket and you have the money to pay out of pocket. What happens to the person who doesn't have the time? They have an hourly job. They have every reason to be depressed and anxious. I mean, here in Northern Virginia, you know, we're depressed and anxious perhaps genetically, but perhaps because we're worried our kid didn't, isn't going to get into Princeton. There's first world problems and then you have the, the very real challenges of the less fortunate and they need to be able to see a mental health professional and they need a lot more education about why these are not uh, character flaws. With the cost containment aspect of the model, what I'm really referring to is legislation for the pharmaceutical industry and also standardization of billing practices with surgery centers and hospitals. One of the ways to contain costs is through pharmaceutical legislation. It's not really fair, is it, if one drug company increases their profits 500 percent in one year. That's crazy. We need something to control that. Also, we have an opiate epidemic in America, and so legislation to curb Opiate abuse is also important. Another cost containment feature is hospitals and surgical centers that have unstandardized billing practices. So, for example, you may have a procedure in one hospital at a certain cost, and you can shop around and find a very different cost structure at another hospital. If you don't have universal health care, really what you have is the current system, which is what's called as the private sector. So you've got different insurance companies that are large conglomerates, and they're fighting each other. It's a very competitive game, and they're trying to get more patients. Universal health care is great at consolidating all of this you know, into one system. You can still use these principles in the private sector as well. And it's OK if private companies are competing with a universal health care system. My vision in order to combine all of these ideas together in a functional way is a centralized computer system that is prevention-based, provides education automatically, triggers case management, whether that's telephonic or field case management, and also combines and consolidates medical records. You can use genetic information, along with family history and current medical status to predict outcomes and risk as well. Technology, and I was going to say on the horizon, except that it's here, that allows interconnectivity is a fantastic achievement. It's going to revolutionize healthcare. There's um, a national push, in fact, the High Tech Act of 2010, the one that um, talked about HIPAA also created an office of the National Coordinator, ONC, and they have called together a number of um, private government collaborations, consortia, to work on interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is now here, so they know where your medical, every doctor you've ever been to, where you've been is available. If you give permission, your doctor's is going to be able to have that integrated into their electronic medical record system. And that's going to be a huge boom. The integration of genomics with the information in the electronic medical record and with the history and the physical examination is going to have a profound impact on medicine. A uh, personalized medicine, as they call it, or understanding through genetics as to how a particular treatment might better manage a person's illness, all that comes into play. So as we gather all this data through genomics, what have you, it all works towards better diagnosing and better managing a patient, ultimately. When you look at the future of where we're going with our healthcare system, it is miraculous the things that we're going to be able to do. To take a drop of blood from somebody and look at their DNA and know what diseases they're susceptible to or likely to get throughout their lifetime. If you have a pre-existing condition, it's okay. Everyone is covered. And it's also okay if 
the private sector competes with this plan. So we're not cutting out the private sector and saying, you can't compete. And either way, I think it's beneficial for either a universal health care system or the private system to adopt these principles of case management. The reason it's important to have case management in either system is because it improves efficiency and it helps to reduce medical costs. I'm not a liberal, I'm not a conservative, I'm just looking at this as an individual and I really see how um, Things have really gone wrong, and it's it's refreshing to see some things, some of the things that are being done to uh, make people healthier. Healthcare should not be a political issue. It's become one, but uh, much of what we do seeks to make healthcare uh, an apolitical issue. It's really about people. It's it, it's it's not politics, and we try to do everything we can to keep it in that vein. I think that there is a way forward and there's always going to be a way forward for a solution on Capitol Hill. I wouldn't be working in DC, I wouldn't be walking the halls of Congress if I didn't think there was a solution. Healthcare is a unique issue, unlike any other political issue that we deal with, in that it touches everybody. Every business, every family, every individual in this country every day in some way deals with the cost of healthcare. Because of the burden of Medicare for All, it's important to have an alternative that is much more cost effective. Medicare for All costs about $3.5 trillion a year, and it's important for people to understand that places a huge burden on the economy. With the plan that I've developed, you save about 40% of that, which is $1.4 trillion, and that's important to save the economy. The healthcare system is broken, but it doesn't have to be. Whether we subscribe to universal healthcare, the private system, or a combination, innovative options like free market healthcare and coordinated care for all provide solutions. Perhaps more innovation is just on the horizon. Legislative change needs your support. My name is Paul Roberts. Uh, I'm the executive producer and the writer for uh, the documentary Diagnosing Healthcare. I've been in case management, medical case management, for uh, about 20 years and own my own medical case management company. Uh, and in that time, you know, understood the value of medical case management. And what I mean is coordination of care. Um, making sure everybody's on the same page, things aren't falling through the cracks, going to bat for uh, patients and being a patient advocate. Uh, and, and so I understood the value of this and I started questioning why is this really only being used in the workers' comp sector mostly, uh, with a few other exceptions, maybe hospital discharge and that sort of thing. And why can't this be expanded, this skill set be expanded to the wider healthcare sector? You know, to me it didn't make sense. So, so I started thinking about it and developing this uh, healthcare plan uh, that I have that's called Coordinated uh, Care for All, uh, which is kind of a, a play on Medicare for All, Coordinated Care for All. And, uh, but it's, um, it's really using those same principles uh, to improve the efficiency of the system. I actually, I saw these presidential candidates, you know, one after another, um, saying, well, we don't really have any other uh, choices for health care. We have basically Medicare for all, which is universal health care, or we basically have nothing, uh, or um, an expansion on Obamacare, uh, ACA. You know, I'm thinking, well, I have these other ideas. Why not write to these presidential candidates and see if I can get their attention and uh, you know, share these ideas with him. Well, I wrote to each one, never heard back, uh, tried writing to my congressman and working with my congressman, uh, didn't get anywhere. You know, and I've known, uh, I've got friends that are lobbyists in DC that have been doing it 20 years and just not moving the ball, just not getting anywhere. 
you know, with uh, health care reform. So I thought, well, what's, what's it going to take? We, we need this grassroots movement, um, and that's where I get the idea of, of doing a documentary, uh, is to create a, a grassroots movement to, to urge Congress for change for the better. Yeah, the production process, we just uh, finished filming, as you know. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been very happy with uh, the filming process, and now we're going to be moving on to the editing process. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to being inv involved in that. Um, it's, it's pretty exciting. I mean, I think everybody is affected by healthcare in one way or the other. You know, we're all affected by it. Uh, and, you know, I see these gross inefficiencies, and, um, you know, I, I formulated a more comprehensive plan for that reason, incorporating you know, prevention, education, you know, and, and genetics and all, all these different things, consolidation of medical records, uh, along with case management. So, you know, I, I'm trying to do my part and I'm just hoping that other people uh, get that, you know, and understand the value and share that with other people.